Hey guys, welcome, welcome back to my channel. My name is Mike. You guys are rocking with me and Mike is Intellectual Corner. On today's episode, we are diving back into our Napoleonic Wars series with Epic History TV. This is Napoleon Endgame France, like 1814. Without further ado, we're just going to dive right into it. Let's go. In October 1813, Napoleon had suffered his heaviest ever defeat at Leipzig, the Battle of the Nations. Surviving French forces, exhausted, sick and demoralised, retreated to the River Rhine and prepared to defend France from invasion. For the first time in the entire Napoleonic Wars, since, uh, I'm going to say since the uh, French Revolution, since like 1790-something, has the France been invaded, which is kind of crazy to think about. Like, all these wars have been taking place, which really, I want to say, in Germany and Russia, but still, it's pretty crazy to think about. But in November, the armies of the Sixth Coalition paused their advance, and Austrian Foreign Minister Metternich offered peace terms. The Frankfurt proposals would allow Napoleon to keep his throne if France returned to her so-called natural frontiers. It was the best offer Napoleon was likely to get, now that his back was to the wall, and all Europe's great powers were united against him. And honestly, it's kind of a one that he should have took, because if you think about it, if France would have been able to build its borders up to its natural borders, up to the River Rhine and all that stuff, it actually would have had the best defensive borders of any like country, essentially almost on the, in the world. Like it's pretty well built with all these different, you know, uh, natural barriers in it. Were united against him. Even so, he did not accept the terms. He merely agreed to reopen negotiations. To the Allies and many in France itself, it proved that Napoleon would not listen to reason. The war went on, and by January 1814, Napoleon's situation looked even worse. Many of his besieged garrisons in the east were starved into surrender. Marshal Davout, with 34,000 men in Hamburg, was now besieged. Denmark, one of France's last allies, was invaded by Bernadotte's Swedish army and made to join the coalition. French troops evacuated the Netherlands, which reasserted its independence after nearly 20 years of French control. In Italy, Eugène's army faced a new enemy, Joachim Murat, King of Naples, now marching north with 30,000 men to honour his new alliance with the Sixth Coalition. In Paris, Napoleon responded to the crisis with a series of extreme measures. Property taxes doubled, state salaries and pensions suspended, 300,000 new conscripts called up, from a country already exhausted by 20 years of war. Yeah, yeah we're pretty much in uh, at the end game. This is truly the end game. This is like emergency mode. He ordered the release of Pope Pius, under French house arrest for the last five years, to try to shore up his support in Italy. He even agreed to release Fernando, the Bourbon King of Spain, to take up his throne in exchange for peace between France and Spain, a condition that Fernando was in no position to honor. Because at this point, I'm pretty sure they're tired of all of it, so really it's kind of too late for all that. But these concessions were too little, far too late. In January, two coalition armies crossed the Rhine into France. Blücher's army of Silesia... For the first time in nearly 20 years since the 17th... ...and Schwarzenberg's army of Bohemia. Outnumbered French forces in their path could only fall back. On the 25th of January, Napoleon said farewell to his wife and son at the Tuileries Palace, before leaving for the front. 
he would never see either of them again. With just 70,000 men, he faced odds of four to one. Most of his troops were raw conscripts, some without uniforms, many just learning how to hold a musket. So we're scraping the bottom, bottom, bottom of the barrel at this point, you know what I'm saying? They're just literally whoever they can find, you know what I'm saying? You, 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 let's roll, you know what I'm saying? It's learning how to hold a musket. But for the first time in years, Napoleon's army was so small that he'd be able to exercise direct command over all its movements. The result would be one of the most audacious and brilliant campaigns in history. The battle for France would be fought east of Paris, mostly across Champagne, a flat region divided by the rivers Marne and Seine and their tributaries. In late January, fields were dusted with snow and roads quickly turned to mud. Napoleon learned that the coalition armies were widely scattered. Which is exactly what you don't want to do to, with Napoleon, you know what I'm saying, to be scattered. Let's see what happens, because you already know he's good at picking them off one by one. ...were widely scattered, with part of Blücher's army near Napoleon's old college at Brienne. The Emperor advanced rapidly, hoping to trap and destroy part of Blücher's army. But after a hard day's fighting that cost both sides 3,000 casualties, Blücher was able to retreat towards Schwarzenberg's army. That evening, Napoleon was nearly skewered by a charging Cossack, saved only by General Gorgo's good shooting. As Napoleon tried to work out the enemy's movements, Blücher, heavily reinforced by Schwarzenberg, made a surprise attack at La Rothière. Allied troops advanced through swirling snow to assault the village defiantly held by young French conscripts. One was so inexperienced that Marshal Marmont had to personally show him how to load his musket during the battle. Fortunately, that's what happens when you don't have no time to, um, to train your troops and you just go straight into, well, let's roll, you know what I'm saying, as soon as you get back to your kingdom. By late afternoon, Vreda's Bavarian Corps was falling on Napoleon's flank. Heavily outnumbered, Napoleon had no option but to retreat, having lost 5,000 casualties and 73 guns abandoned in the thick mud. The Allies' frontal attacks meant their losses were greater, but by combining their armies, they defeated Napoleon on French soil for the first time. Believing Napoleon would now retreat towards Paris, the Allies decided to advance along two routes to ease pressure on the roads. Blücher would take a northern route along the Marne. Schwarzenberg would follow the Seine. But dividing their armies again would play right into Napoleon. Because this is his, this is his war strategy. It's literally in his war book. He, he, his enemy has to be divided in order for him to be able to do what he needs to do. His hands. After two days to reorganize, Napoleon continued his retreat to Nogent, where he learned that the Allies had split their armies. Not only that, they were advancing at different speeds. The aggressive Blücher racing ahead, while the more cautious Schwarzenberg lagged behind. Leaving Oudinot and Victor to guard the Seine bridges and delay Schwarzenberg, Napoleon raced north through mud and rain with 30,000 men. The army of Silesia was strung out on the march, oblivious to the danger it was in. 
it's like as soon as they get into France, they're so like, you know what I'm saying? Like so when, you know, they get so tunnel visioned and so excited to, at the fact that they were this close to finally defeating him. Everything that they practice, everything that they preach, everything that they, you know, all of it just went right out the window and they just act. First, Napoleon fell on General Osufiev's Russian 9th Corps at Champaubert, destroying it, taking its commander and 2,000 men prisoner. The next morning, he marched on General Austin Sacken's force near Montmiral. This was a much <coughs> larger force, with two infantry and one cavalry corps, and was expecting support from York's Prussian 1st Corps. But the Prussians were late and Sacken's troops could not withstand the French onslaught. At this desperate hour, the Emperor's elite old guard were no longer held back, but were often thrown into the thick of the fighting. By the end of the day, Napoleon had inflicted another 3,500 casualties, twice his own losses, and the Allies were in rapid retreat. But of course, he was using them to more degree because, I mean, if you think about it, his old guard is, is pretty much one of his only, you know what I'm saying, experienced forces, really, that's really, you know, it's going to be consistently, you know what I'm saying, in there and not get, you know, routed or anything like that. Retreat. Napoleon had ordered Marshal MacDonald to cut off the enemy's escape by seizing the Marne Bridge at Chateau Thierry. But York's Prussians got there first. The next day, Napoleon could only batter their rear guard as the enemy fled across the Marne, destroying the bridge behind them. Sending Marshal Mortier to rebuild the bridge and continue the pursuit, Napoleon doubled back to rejoin Marmont, who had been left to keep watch on Blücher. Napoleon attacked at Vauchamp using General Grouchy's cavalry to outflank Blücher's army, which was soon in headlong retreat. A merciless French pursuit inflicted 6,000 Prussian and Russian casualties. Napoleon lost just 600 men. I think so, most of those casualties probably came in the route where people were just running in their backs to the people with the spears and all that, or, you know what I'm saying, the, the javelins and all that stuff, and just all that. It's, Casualties. Napoleon lost just 600 men. Napoleon had taken on an enemy army almost twice his size and beaten it four times in just six days. Blücher had lost an estimated 15,000 casualties in battle and another 15,000 in smaller engagements as stragglers or deserters. For now, the army of Silesia had been scattered and neutralized. But in the south, Marshals Victor and Oudinot had not been able to prevent Schwarzenberg's Army of Bohemia from crossing the Seine in three places. Austrian troops were now just 40 miles from Paris. Leaving Mortier and Marmont to keep watch on Blücher, Napoleon raced south. Schwarzenberg, alarmed by news of Blücher's defeat and of Napoleon's approach, immediately ordered a retreat. It was too late for Wittgenstein's advance guard, routed at Mormain with 2,000 casualties. Napoleon sent Victor's second corps to seize the bridge at Montereau, but was so infuriated by its slow progress that he sacked Victor. At this point, there, he has no no like no area for weakness, you know what I'm saying? You gotta be on your shit, otherwise you're just in his way, you gotta go. ...and gave his corps to General Gérard. The next day, at the Battle of Montereau, the French drove the Allied Württemberg Corps back across the river, with 30% losses. According to some accounts, the Emperor sighted the French cannon himself, as he had at Lodi, that's a true uh, artillery man, true and true. Uh, if you, you know what I'm saying, you gotta get in there, and especially when you get all heat and stuff, you just, you just gotta get into onto that cannon, you just gotta get on it. 18 years before, 
Napoleon had the Allies on the run. But how long could it last? Even as fighting continued, negotiations between France and the coalition reopened at Châtillon-sur-Seine on the 5th of February. The Allied terms were now more severe. A return to France's frontiers of 1791, which meant the additional loss of Belgium, a humiliation that Napoleon refused to accept. Instead, he tried to revive the Frankfurt proposals hoping to play for time and to split the coalition, whose war aims varied from Britain's hard line to Austria's more ambiguous position. But this hope was thwarted by British Foreign Secretary Lord Castlereagh. On the 1st of March, he persuaded the Allies to sign the Treaty of Chaumont. In it, Russia, Prussia, Austria and Great Britain agreed to keep 150,000 troops in the field and not to negotiate separately with France, while Britain added the sweetener of a £5 million subsidy to be shared among the Allies. The treaty's secret articles specified common war aims, including the future independence of the German states, Switzerland and Italy, while Spain was to be returned to the Bourbons and Holland to the House of Orange. Yeah, so pretty much this new treaty is going to essentially undo every single thing that Napoleon has done in the past 20 years. Essentially every single thing. So essentially Napoleon has done fuck. It took Austria's secessions whenever they gave them to him like, what, two years ago? Whenever they were, before they joined the war, they, he should have took those ones. Because that would have still left him with a crap ton of, of everything. So now he's just... He's, he's fucked. And Holland to the House of Orange. The four powers even agreed that once they'd defeated Napoleon, they'd form a 20-year defensive alliance to maintain peace in Europe, a sign of their newfound commitment to each other. A split in the coalition had been Napoleon's last best hope for a favourable peace. That was gone and news from across the country was bleak. French cities were surrendering to the Allies without a fight. Nancy, Dijon and Macon had all fallen. In the south, Wellington defeated Marshal Soult at Ortez, forcing him to fall back on Toulouse. Two weeks later, as British troops approached the city of Bordeaux, it declared loyalty to France's Bourbon kings. The mayor himself rode out to greet the British, bearing a white cockade, the sign of Bourbon allegiance. Napoleon's hope for a nation in arms to resist the Allies had not materialised. Allied troops... Yeah, in my opinion, you know how, uh, and there's no dig towards France, but you know how, uh, you know, the leading joke with France is, you know, they gave, they gave up and stuff like that. When it kind of, to me, uh, I think this should probably be more the, the, the topic the fact that their country gave up so damn easily in the Napoleonic Wars, rather than their country gave up during World War II, because, I mean, they fought 90,000 90, troops gave their lives for that freaking country, so... And even then, when they were occupied, they freaking spat on, you know, they hated the Germans, so... But in any case, I definitely think that this should probably top that, because their entire freaking uh, country is just giving up, like, hey, there you go, there you go, there you go, like, greeting them and everything, it's crazy had not materialised. Allied troops, particularly Cossacks, often robbed French civilians and committed some atrocities. French peasants took revenge when they could, but there was no guerrilla war to mirror what French troops had encountered in Spain or Russia. The chief desire among ordinary French people was for peace, at almost any price. Any talk of Napoleon's defeat in late February was premature. 
the French Emperor was driving Schwarzenberg's army of Bohemia before him, even though it was twice his size. But Schwarzenberg scrambled to safety behind the River Obe. Napoleon knew he had to land another decisive blow soon, so turned his attention back to Blücher. After an aborted attempt to join forces with Schwarzenberg, Blücher had decided to resume his advance on Paris, gathering reinforcements en route, and with only Marmont and Mortier's weak corps to oppose him. Leaving Marshal Macdonald in command in the south, Napoleon set off to intercept Blücher. Yeah, that's 30 miles a day. My man was moving, moving. Intercept Blücher, covering 60 miles in three days along terrible roads choked with mud. At Napoleon's approach, Blücher retreated across the Marne, burning the bridges behind him. 24 hours later, they'd been rebuilt by French engineers, and Napoleon was poised to crush Blücher against the Enne River, because the major crossing point at Soissons was held by a Franco-Polish garrison. But after just a day's fighting, the garrison commander at Soissons tamely surrendered, allowing Blücher to escape. Napoleon continued his pursuit across the Enne, still hoping to cut off the army of Silesia. But well, at unfortunately, he kind of split himself up there too, so that obviously helped out the Russians tremendously. But at Craon, he encountered Russian troops in a strong defensive position. The Russians fought stubbornly. The French finally forced the enemy to withdraw, but only at the cost of 6,000 casualties, including many irreplaceable veterans from Napoleon's guard. Napoleon pushed on to Long. But by now, Blücher had concentrated his forces, 98,000 troops in all, and outnumbered Napoleon two to one. French attacks were repulsed, while Marmont's corps was caught off guard by a late Allied counterattack and routed. Napoleon was lucky to avoid a much heavier defeat. Blücher, usually aggressive to the point of rest. Well, that and obviously coupled with the strong out defeats for the past freaking you know, months, so obviously he's not trying to give Napoleon a decisive defeat because he knows once he's out, he is. Especially with a hundred thousand men, it's you know it's going to take a really bad hit on the on your uh, their land. So. Recklessness was unwell, and had been told Napoleon's army was twice as big as it was, leading him to act with unusual caution. Long was a heavy blow to Napoleon. Six and a half thousand casualties he could not afford. Undaunted, he fell back to Soissons, and after a brief moment to reorganize, he marched on the city of Reims, which had just fallen to Saint-Priest's Russian corps. In a whirlwind assault, Napoleon retook the city. Saint-Priest himself was mortally wounded, his corps routed. Meanwhile, in the south, Schwarzenberg had resumed his offensive as soon as he found out Napoleon had gone north. In heavy fighting, he'd driven Oudinot and Macdonald back from the River Obe. Five days later, the Allies had recaptured Troyes as Macdonald retreated behind the River Seine. Now, after four days to rest and reorganize his battered army, Napoleon was coming south once more. Schwarzenberg, emboldened by news of Napoleon's defeat at Laon, decided that this time he would stand and fight. Napoleon advanced on Arcis-sur-Urbe, 
ignoring reports that the enemy was not retreating as he believed, but gathering for battle. As heavy fighting broke out, Napoleon still believed he faced only the enemy rearguard. That's why you gotta have your freaking scouts and stuff like that. You gotta freaking, you know what I'm saying? We, we, we gotta take, uh, you can't take for granted the times we live in of how easy it is to get a freaking uh, satellite picture of somebody from above. Because back then it was, it was, you know what I'm saying, ridiculous to try to get. Napoleon still believed he faced only the enemy rearguard. It was a nasty surprise to discover that he faced the entire might of the Army of Bohemia. 28,000 men against 80,000. In desperate fighting, Napoleon personally rallied fleeing troops and exposed himself to enemy fire, having his horse killed under him by an exploding shell. But the odds were too great. At the end of the second day, Napoleon was forced to order the retreat. Napoleon believed his army was now too weak to take on the Allies directly, so he decided to change strategy. He would march into the rear of the Allied armies, join up with some of his isolated garrisons, and cut the enemy's lines of communication, forcing them to. A I'll say at this point, you gotta kind of start thinking outside the box, and yeah, that's pretty smart, especially with that huge garrison that means back there. You might as well go ahead and use them. Abandon their advance on Paris. But the Allies until now always one step behind Napoleon, had just received crucial information. Talleyrand, the most brilliant French diplomat of the age, and the most slippery. He'd served France's monarchy, the revolution, then Napoleon, until in 1807 he fell out irrevocably with the emperor over foreign policy. He now believed that Napoleon was dragging France into ruin, and worked behind the scenes to ensure his downfall. From Paris, he wrote to the Russian Emperor Alexander at Allied headquarters, informing him that in the capital, support for Napoleon was crumbling, and the city's defences had been completely neglected. He urged the Allies to march immediately on Paris, without allowing Napoleon to distract them. Talleyrand's information was confirmed when the Allies intercepted a report from Napoleon's chief of police, General Savary, meant for the Emperor. The treasury, arsenals and powder stores are empty. We are completely at the end of our resources. The population is discouraged and discontented, wishing peace at any price. As Napoleon advanced on Saint-Dizier, the Allies sent General Witzingerode and 10,000 cavalry to harass his army and to screen their own movements. Then began their march on Paris. At Fer Champenoise, they collided with Marmont and Mortier's corps, advancing to join Napoleon. An entire National Guard division, 5,000 men, was virtually wiped out as the... Damn, that is freaking insane right there. You can't, at this point, he uh, he's not gonna get any of these numbers back, so he's already done. Marshall suffered a crushing defeat. Napoleon feared that the fall of Paris would be a fatal blow to his regime. His political authority and ability to wage war might not recover. So, when he received news of the Allies' movements, he tore up his plans, and ordered a forced march back to Paris, intending to lead its defence in person. Napoleon's wife and son were evacuated from the capital, along with most of his ministers. His brother, Joseph, the ex-King of Spain, was in charge of the city's defences, but had done little. 
I was about to say, we just had a whole freaking letter about how he did little. So, I mean, is that really, does it really matter? You know? Paris was awash with rumors of treachery and defeat. Marmont and Mortier were able to reach Paris before the Allies, adding their troops to the garrison. It now totaled 37,000 men, including some hardened veterans of the Guard, but many more young conscripts, while a third were part-time soldiers of the National Guard. The Allies had 120,000 seasoned troops outside the city, and given the urgency of taking Paris before Napoleon could intervene, their elite guards and grenadier divisions would lead the way. On the 30th of March, they began their assault from the north. Heavy fighting raged throughout the day. The city's defenders fought bravely, inflicting several thousand casualties on the advancing enemy. But defeat was inevitable. That night, to save Paris from destruction, Marshal Marmont agreed to surrender the city, on condition the garrison was permitted to leave with its weapons. Well, I guess to live to fight another day, but it's crazy that the Allies actually abided by that, because you know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah, go ahead, but you know what I'm saying? We'll see you again. I guess they were so, you know, um, so confident in the fact that they took Paris that it would be such a crushing blow, you know what I'm saying, politically and, you know, you know, pretty much visually on um, the fact that, you know what I'm saying, damn, the, the jewel of the empire pretty much Paris is taken, so, yeah. The garrison was permitted to leave with its weapons. At the Hôtel des Invalides, the 71-year-old Marshal Serrouillet oversaw the burning of 1,400 flags and standards captured from France's enemies, as well as Frederick the Great's sword and sash, so they would not fall into Allied hands. Napoleon was just 15 miles from Paris when he was informed of the city's surrender. He sat with his head in his hands for 15 minutes. On the 31st of March 1814, France's enemies marched into Paris for the first time since the Hundred Years' War. Parisian crowds cheered the three Allied monarchs, bringers of peace. Everyone in Paris was suddenly a royalist once more. Above all, they cheered for Emperor Alexander of Russia, now hailed as Europe's saviour. Don Cossacks bivouacked on the Champs-Élysées. Allied troops generally behaved well. Thirty-five miles away, Napoleon was at Fontainebleau, with 36,000 men, all of them hungry and exhausted. Well, it is insane though. I mean, obviously this is not over, especially with all the Napoleon's troops just right there, but... You can definitely tell he sees the writing on the wall, especially with how animated he always is, you know what I'm saying, how he always wants to stomp around and stuff like that. This would definitely be a stomp around moment, but yet we see him with his hand in his face, or his hand, you know, face in his hands and not really, know what to do, not really knowing what to do right now because he knows, you know, he kind of messed up. And honestly, he kind of burned too many proverbial bridges, in my opinion. He should have really, because he, he cast away so many people that he could have used that could have helped him out in this war, but we're gonna Hungry and exhausted after their 100-mile forced march. Nevertheless, Napoleon began planning an immediate advance on Paris. But for the first time, he faced unanimous opposition from his ministers and marshals, including Ney, Macdonald, Oudinot, and Berthier. They reminded him of his oath to act for the good of France, he accused them of disloyalty, acting only to save themselves. They told him the war was lost, 
and he must abdicate in favour of his son if possible. On the 4th of April, Marshal Marmont surrendered his entire corps to the coalition, which was marched over to the enemy lines against the wishes of many of its officers and men. This was a devastating blow to Napoleon, and encouraged the Allies to reject his offer of a conditional abdication in favour of his son. Two days later, he abdicated without conditions. The Allied powers, having proclaimed that the Emperor Napoleon is the only obstacle to the re-establishment of peace in Europe, the Emperor Napoleon, faithful to his oath, declares that he renounces, for himself and his heirs, the thrones of France and Italy, and that there is no personal sacrifice, including his life, that he is not ready to make in the interests of France. With this, all of Bona all, every Bonaparte is thrown out of the country, which obviously did not last very long, because they're all came right back in the country, like he was playing the third and all them who are there so soon. Napoleon's abdication was formalized by the Treaty of Fontainebleau, by which he was allowed to keep the title of emperor, become sovereign of the small island of Elba, and retain a bodyguard of 400 men. News came too late to prevent Wellington's attack on Toulouse, leading to a costly and pointless battle, with more than 7,000 casualties. The night after his abdication, Napoleon tried to commit suicide, using the poison that had been made for him in Russia. In yeah, and unfortunately we already know the story. Uh, pretty much the vial of poison was too damn old at this point, and it didn't really do anything, just left it bad. And he just gave him a stomachache or something like that. But obviously this man is not done, so don't count him out yet. ...that had been made for him in Russia, in case of capture but it had lost its potency, and he survived. Two weeks later, Napoleon bade farewell to his old guard at Fontainebleau Palace, and began his journey into exile. The Napoleonic Wars, which had raged on land and sea for 11 years, seemed finally at an end. The death toll is unknown, but historians estimate that two to three million lives were lost across Europe. Most soldiers died not in battle, but from disease. Many thousands were left maimed and disfigured. For most of this period, Napoleon was master of Europe, imposing treaties on humbled enemies, redrawing frontiers, overthrowing old regimes, and making new kings. He was the last figure in history to combine total political power with frontline military genius, in the mould of Alexander and Caesar. But it seemed Napoleon's reign the only one who could have probably done that would be uh, George Washington, but obviously he his political reign started after his, um, which we call after his war, because uh, he was dead. I'm pretty sure by 1800, so he couldn't have, you know, he wasn't involved in the war of 1812 or anything like that. So. Was to end in abject military defeat. However, exile on Elba did not prove to Napoleon's taste. In less than 10 months, he would return to France to fight one last great campaign to reclaim his throne. Yep, here comes the Battle of Waterloo, the very last of in the Wars. All right guys, so thank you again for joining me on another episode of Mike's Intellectual Corner. 
this is um, obviously one of the best uh, series that we have that we're watching right now. It's just insane, insane the Napoleonic Wars, how crazy everything was, and just how obviously we think it's a wrap up. Well, it's, you know, we have a lot more to go. So, without further ado, though, if you guys like the video, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. I'll see you guys when I see you. I'm out. <laughs>